Zechariah chapter number 1. I'm going to begin reading in verse number 1. I'm going to read a few more verses than usual this morning. Zechariah chapter number 1, verse number 1. The Bible says, In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo, the prophet, saying, The Lord hath been sore displeased with your fathers. Therefore say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. Be ye not as your fathers, unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye now from your evil ways, and from your evil doings. But they did not hear, nor hearken unto me, saith the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants the prophets, do they not take hold of your fathers? And they returned and said, Like as the Lord of hosts thought to do unto us, according to our ways and according to our doings, so hath he dealt with us. So in these first six verses, the prophet Zechariah gets a message from the Lord to go preach to the children of Israel as he's still in captivity. It says... Verse number one, in the eighth month and the second year of Darius came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah. Now, before Darius came along, there were other Babylonian and Assyrian kings. Israel's still under somebody else's rule. Yet, God had not forgotten them. Why are they in captivity? Because their fathers didn't listen, just like these verses talked about. And as a result of their not listening then God delivered the judgment that he said was going to come upon them but they're in captivity God speaks to Zechariah and he says verse number 2 the Lord hath been sore displeased with your fathers he doesn't start off the message talking about where they're at he starts the message off talking about why they are where they're at you cannot blame a generation for doing the wrong thing when the generation before them didn't teach them what the right thing was. Right? The Lord now is appearing to this generation and saying, the Lord is sore displeased with your fathers. They did wrong. And until you admit that the way that you were brought up was wrong, you're not going to get right. There's a whole lot of people in the world today that are set in their ways because they were raised that way because somebody that they trusted taught them that way because it's the way that they've always done things right that's really the truth behind somebody that's been raised or been taught a false religion now they've been made twofold the child of hell because in order for them to convert they have to be willing to say that the people that they care about and the people that they love that brought them up in that religion were wrong it's real easy to teach me that I am wrong. It's real hard to change my opinion of somebody that I hold in high esteem and get me to admit that they are wrong. Oh, here the Lord's letting them know your fathers were wrong. And because they were wrong, that's why you ended up in the situation that y'all are in today. You're not under King, and then insert Hebrew name. No, you're under King Darius. He's an Assyrian. Now, God did a lot of things. Go read the books of the minor prophets. right? Go read Esther, and you're going to find out a little bit about Darius' lineage. But Darius knew a little bit about God, and the people of God found a space of grace because God always takes care of his own. But they're still not free. They still can't live the way that they want to. They have to live the way that somebody else tells them to. They're still under bondage. They're still under and are subject to a people, a race, a king that does not hold the name of the Lord God as most high. They're more concerned about what they want rather than what God wants. So God appears and he says, your fathers were wrong. That's why you're in this mess. And he says, but therefore say unto them, talking about this generation, 
Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. Sounds a whole lot like if you draw nigh to him, he draws nigh unto you. If you turn to God, God's going to turn in your direction. God is always willing to meet right the one that is looking for God. But he doesn't just show up every time that somebody's not looking for him and make an appointment for him to come face to face. He says, if you're seeking him, you're going to find him. Isn't that what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount? Asking you shall receive, seeking you shall find, knocking it shall be opened unto you. He says, if you get pointed in the right direction, God's going to point himself towards you. Right, well, verse number four, he says, be ye not as your fathers. Again, they did it wrong. You turn because they wouldn't turn. Unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye now from your evil ways and from your evil doings. But they did not hear nor hearken unto me, saith the Lord. These are the ones that the Bible would say were stiff-necked and uncircumcised of heart. That were full of pride. They weren't willing to turn because they weren't willing to admit that they were wrong. The only reason that somebody won't admit that they're wrong is one, they haven't been taught what's right. Or two, two would be you didn't present clear and convincing evidence that they were wrong. Right? I can just walk up to somebody and say, you're wrong for wearing a tie-dye shirt to church today. I, don't think, but I had to pick tie-dye because everybody else had every color of the rainbow on. <laughs> I didn't want to offend somebody. But you're not right for wearing tie-dye shirt to church today. If this conversation ends there and the guy was talking to me, I'd tell him, don't let the door hit you on the way out. Right? That's your opinion. That's not, that's not what God said. Show me chapter and verse on that one. Right? If that tie-dye shirt is the best you've got, we were told to wear the best to the house of God. Right? That's always been the position around here. Best thing you got is a pair of bibbed overalls. Wear the bibbed overalls and worship God. That's all we care about. Don't get hung up on it. Just come to worship. That's the second way somebody not going to... If I'm wrong, but you don't prove to me, I'm not going to... And then the third reason is because they don't want to be wrong. They choose to stay in the wrong, but because they don't want to admit that they're wrong. So they'll try everything that they can do to make wrong right. But that doesn't work. Water and oil don't mix. They always separate. Two wrongs don't make a right. right. It's not shades of gray on what right and wrong is. No, there's right and then there's wrong. It's black and white. And if you mix the two, that's when you start getting gray. But you can't ever start off with black and then end up with white, no matter how much white you mix into it. Right? We all know that. But he's saying, don't be like your fathers, because they tried that. And look at where it ended them up at. Now you're paying the price for their sin. Don't be like them and curse the next generation to live under a king like this. Right? Turn, get things made right. He says, but even them. It wasn't that they were just, keep in mind this book was written to the Hebrews. Even in Jesus' day, they were talking about what did the prophets say. Right? They all got, what did Moses and the prophets say? Right? And the story of the Lazarus and the rich ruler right? the rich ruler being in hell asked Father Abraham send Moses and the prophets that they might witness to my brother and he said even if Lazarus rose from the dead if it, they don't listen to Moses and the prophets they're not going to believe even if somebody was raised from the dead that's how much the Hebrews believed what Moses and the prophets were given by God so who did the preaching to the Hebrews the prophets Right, the ones that they clung to so much in their so-called religious beliefs. But they missed the mark. He's saying, I didn't send some nobody. No, we sent the prophets. The ones that God chose, the best. The ones that were chosen to deliver the message because God knew that they would deliver it the way that God needed it to be delivered. He says, they didn't listen to that. It's not like there was just some guy off the street. No, God sent the one that needed to be sent. And the message was delivered the way it was meant to be delivered. And they didn't hear it. 
And who was doing the talking? God was doing the talking. So in that scenario, why didn't the Israelites admit that they were wrong? Because of pride. God gave them all the evidence that what they were doing was wrong. And when they were confronted with it, then they knew that they were wrong. So why did they stay wrong? Because they didn't want to admit that they were wrong. So they tried everything that they could to justify themselves, and where did it end them up? In captivity. In fact, at this point, Israel mostly was a ghost town. The walls had been rebuilt, but it wasn't the Israel that David and Solomon had. The Israel that when God blessed Israel with peace under Solomon's rule, where they had everything else that the world desired, but they had God, most importantly. What not that Israel? This is a ghost town. It don't even resemble what it used to resemble. In fact, if you were raised in Jerusalem and you went back to Jerusalem, all the landmarks that you'd be looking for to try and find your way around, they'd be gone. To this day, the only thing left of Solomon's temple is the Wailing Wall. What happened to the rest of it? Burnt down to the ground. Raised. No evidence left of it. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? I'm saying God showed them. If you don't want God, God's taking what God gave you back. Well, verse number five. Your fathers, where are they? Well, they're in captivity or they're dead. One or the other. And the prophets, do they live forever? Rhetorical question. Nope. But my words and my statutes which I commanded my servants the prophets did they not take hold of your fathers in other words your fathers aren't everlasting the prophets aren't everlasting but the word of God is well prove it brother Jordan you're holding a copy of it in your lap there's a copy forever settled in heaven he exalted his own word above his own name you have a copy today because God preserved His Word. It does last. The fact that they still had, even after everything had been raised, there were still those that had copies of the words of God, and they were still copying them through the scribes to make sure that the next generation would always have a copy. So when he asked them, but my words and my statutes, did they not take hold of your fathers? He's saying, didn't my prophecies come true? Aren't my words something that you can trust in? He says, And they returned and said, Like as the Lord of hosts thought to do unto us, according to our ways and according to our doings, so hath he dealt with us. In other words, he's saying, Didn't I say that something was going to happen if they didn't repent? And didn't they come back and tell you? Just like God said it was going to happen, it happened. They're saying, It's not just that my word is all endurance, it's true. You can preserve a lie as long as you want to, but it's still a lie. Doesn't mean that it's going to happen the way that somebody said it would happen. You can take Nostradamus and all the studies and do whatever you want with them. It ain't going to happen. But how do you know that, Brother Jordan? Because I don't find that God ever gave Nostradamus a special vision. In fact, after the Apostle Paul died, or the Apostle John died, all those apostolic gifts of prophecy and everything else, they went the way of the dodo. Because that which is perfect had come. You know what God wants you to know? Right here. You know how it's going to happen? Right here. You know what's right and wrong? What's in here? That never changed. So I want to draw your attention to verse number four. Notice the message. Now God does a lot of summarizing here. God sent a lot of prophets that preached a lot of messages and delivered a lot of rebukes toward the children of Israel but I want you to notice how he summarizes it here in verse number 4 he says be not be not as your fathers unto whom the four the former prophets have cried saying thus saith the Lord of hosts turn ye now from your evil ways and from your evil doings so what's the message summed up that God always was sending to Israel turn repent okay Ye now, not tomorrow, today. Today is the day of salvation. Right? From your evil ways and from your evil doings. 
What did God have a problem with? Evil. Not evil can evil, but evil. What has God always had a problem with? Evil. What tree did Eve take the fruit of and eat and then give to Adam and then he did eat? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Anybody that's ever told you that they ate of the tree of life, mark that guy down as a liar. God said there is one tree that they should not touch, that they should not eat the fruit of, that they shouldn't, you know, later on, Eve says, we weren't even allowed to look at it. That's not what God said. God said, just don't eat the fruit of that tree. Adam was supposed to tend the garden. How could he tend to the tree if he couldn't look at it and couldn't touch it? They just wasn't supposed to eat of it. And it wasn't a tree of life. That's why God had to kick them out of the Garden of Eden was because of the tree of life. They could eat of the tree of life all they wanted to. But the tree of life, they didn't like the taste of that as much as they liked the unknown of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And I think I thought or I preached one or another one, the tree of life isn't enough for you. But anyway, different message. That's why God had to put a chair down there with a flaming sword to guard the entrance to the Garden of Eden so that they wouldn't come back in, eat of the tree of life, and then have eternal life in their sin-cursed state. It's also why you're not going to find any remnant of the Garden of Eden anymore. What happened? God put it there and then God unplanted it. He took it back. When that happened? Probably in the flood. I don't know. But it's gone. But what's the problem? The problem is that Adam and Eve only knew good, but then they also knew evil. All that they knew was what God told them, which was what? Life. It was fellowship. It was a perfect environment. Right? In fact, God didn't rest until he looked at man, saw that he had a help meet, right? that was willing and able to do and be what God desired. And it wasn't until everything was perfect that he said, all right, I'm done. Did all of it in six days. Took a seven day off. But that'd really mess with some of y'all's calendars if God did it in six days and didn't take a day off. But God did it until everything was what? Perfect. It was good, as Genesis tells us. He looked and saw that everything was good. Everything that he made was good, but Adam had a part of him that he said it's not good for man to dwell alone Adam was good he was made perfect in God's image but it wasn't good for Adam to dwell alone so what did he do he made a help meet and he saw that it was good and when everything was good God said that's good what did Adam and Eve know they knew the goodness of God that's all they knew So then by partaking in the tree of knowledge, they understood by learning what evil was because they had just committed sin, they also understood that everything that they knew before was good. Look at it this way. If you lived in Alaska for like, I don't know, about three months of the year, sun never goes down. Right, you might get like two hours of darkness a day. And then if you live there in the opposite two months of the year, sun only comes up for about two hours a day. Right, or if he was up on the North Pole. If you was raised in that environment and you came here, you would never know that there was a thing called night. Right, you just got a break from sunburn or you just got a break from realizing that, oh, the sun still does exist. We're not in eternal darkness. Okay. Right? That would be a shock to you because you didn't know anything else. Well, when they took the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they realized, oh, we understood good, but now we also know what evil is. They had never known night. They had never known darkness. They had never known plants that had thorns on them. They had never known sickness. They had never known death. In fact, they didn't even learn what death was before their children learned what death was. Because Cain slew Abel. You would expect that if Adam and Eve were the first, they would be the first to taste death. Nope, their children paid the price for that before they did. 
So when he says the problem was evil, the problem's always been evil. But see, nowadays when we hear evil, we think of guys like Hitler and Stalin and Chairman whatever his name was, the first communist leader of China, right, who have millions and millions of people that died because of either their hand or because of orders and policies that they put in place. We think of mass evil on those accounts. Right? Speaking of which, compared to Stalin, Hitler's in like third place. Right? But we brush that under the rug because Stalin helped us fight Hitler. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? We think of evil as a amalgus concept that you can't wrap it. There's just some people that are evil. Well, there are some people that it by evil right God talks about ever, any sinner can get to a point where he turns them over to a reprobate mind what's that mean that they are completely controlled by the urges of this flesh and the urges of this world that certainly is evil I think when you know people go and they say well we interviewed this guy or that guy in prison when you look in his eyes there's nothing there that's what I think a rep now I don't know I can't read reprobate on somebody's brain. There may be just as much hope for that person to get saved as there was for you to get saved. But there are accounts where people say, I sat down across the room from that guy and he ain't right. There's something in him that is more bad, more evil than anything else that I've ever encountered. And I've been interviewing people like this for decades. Right? We think of that as evil. That's not what the Bible says is evil. We think of evil as the worst of the worst. We think that there's bad, worse, and then evil. No. You're thinking about it as man thinks about it. Because man doesn't want to admit that man is wrong. So man tries to justify evil and introduce shades of gray. If we were to poll not just everybody in the building, but let's just say everybody that's been in one of our services in the past year, what do you think evil is? I wonder how many of them would line up with what the Bible says evil is. Because we think of evil as the world has taught us evil is. Most people aren't evil. Right? That's just a few people. Most people are good people. Well, maybe morally. Maybe according to society. But see, it's God talking. We can't use man's definitions with what God is trying to say. We've got to use God's definition to understand what God's talking about. Because what was his problem? The fact that they were evil and that they were doing evil things. And he's talking to God's people. So the Old Testament being given to us as our in sample, right, examples, how do we pull that to the, to the church age? These are God's people. Right? He's talking to those that know they were chosen, know that God chose them for a reason, they know that God gave Moses the Ten Commandments and then the rest of the law. They know that once upon a time there was a guy named David who resisted an evil king named Saul who disobeyed God and then God installed David. And then David had to go fight a few wars to keep things the way that God said that they ought to be. Then, after David died, God gave him Solomon. And Solomon, because he loved the Lord, because he desired to have the wisdom of God, so that he could lead God's people the right way. They had an age of unprecedented peace where everybody wanted to be friends with Israel. And then, because things went sideways, they lost all of it. They knew that much. That much of the oral tradition had to be handed down. God brought them out of Egypt, gave them what he promised Abraham, and then everything was good, and then something went sideways. We hear God's telling them what went sideways. Your fathers... Not just their generation, but he's talking about their forefathers. Somewhere along the line, they started mingling with evil, and God kept telling them, repent, but they wouldn't. So what is evil? Well, according to your Bible, evil is anything that goes outside of what God says is acceptable. Now, we understand what we think that means. But see, God's real concerned about what he said. Because one, he just said that it is everlasting. Remember, he said, but what happened with my words? They came true. Your fathers and the prophets have been gone. 
But guess where my word is? Same place that it ever was. In fact, when Jesus came, the Bible talks about him fulfilling every jot and tittle of the law. You know what that means? God's really interested in the details of what he finds acceptable. So it's not just, well, we didn't do that. No, you either do all of it or you do none of it. So what is God's expectation? What does God find acceptable? Holiness. Amen. End of list. Can't be added to. Can't be taken away from. What does God find acceptable? Jesus. Why? Because he was holy. What does he expect you to be? Holy. According all the time, be ye holy for I am holy. How's the only way for you to be holy? To be in Christ and for Christ to be in you. But see, again, he's talking to his chosen people. They were in captivity, but they were still God's chosen people. Just a side note, don't know where this came from, but just because somebody's backslid doesn't mean that they're not a child of God. He's talking to his people. And he's telling them, turn. You need to repent for some things. Well, what's he saying? Same thing that your fathers were guilty of. Evil. And the fact that you do evil. Now, let me draw a line right here. The Bible says that your heart is deceitfully wicked and no man can know it. What does that mean? Your heart in its carnal nature is evil. Your flesh has evil desires. It wants to do that which the Lord says not to do. But then there's that inward man after you get saved, the new creature, what does he desire to do? He desires life. He desires to do the will of the Father. He desires to uphold the commandments of God. And that is our struggle until we either go into the grave or we go through the rapture. That is the cross that Christ said to take up and to follow after him with you are no longer of this world but you're stuck in this world and you're stuck in the body that's cursed to go back to the world but he did promise that greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world he empowered you go read the beginning of Revelation to be a king and a priest a priest so that you don't have to pray through anybody else in order to get to Jesus you can enter directly into the throne room of God but to a king to rule and reign over this flesh to put it in subjection to keep it there and to live the way that God intended you to live okay I've said this does not the Bible say that God is not the author of temptation so why would God tell you to do something if he knew you couldn't do it because that would be making you with no other way of getting out of it a sinner Right? He would be commanding you to do something that he knew you couldn't do, so you would be damned for falling short of God's commandments. Well, after you get saved, he tells you to be holy. You know what that tells me? You can be holy. Because if you couldn't be, he wouldn't have told you to be holy. Now, we're robed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ after we get saved, so that when the Father sees us, he sees him. But he also told us to be holy, to live holy, to do holy. Why? Because that's what God finds acceptable. Anything short of holiness is evil. Then you say, Brother Jordan, I know that I'm not perfect. Didn't tell you to be perfect. God told you to be holy. He didn't tell you that you had to be you know, he didn't tell you to go out and be as holy as you could be. He said, holy. Were we going to fall short of that? Yeah. But if I'm faithful to confess it, he's faithful to cleanse and forgive. Someone that's trying to holy, when they realize they're not holy, guess what they do? They turn from it. They get up under the blood. You know what Israel's problem was? Eventually they started thinking, well, that's not bad enough to go down and offer up a sacrifice for. I really don't have to confess it. We'll just take care of that later. And later's never going to come. What did he say? He said, turn now from evil. Not tomorrow. 
when do you turn when you find out that it's a problem he said it doesn't become evil right because you're not going to go do evil if you repent of it how many times are you going to have to repent of it until you finally get it nailed down but continual repentance is part of the process of being holy you can't go a day you can't, I dare say you can't go an hour if you really think about it without having to stop at least ten times and saying Lord forgive me for that but you know what the difference between asking for forgiveness and turning is turning means you purpose that you're not going to do it again now I understand habits are hard to break why do you think so many people that stop smoking cigarettes start chewing gum like, you know, they keep Wrigley's in business? Right? They just traded one habit for another. Breaking one's really hard. Trading one's off is a little bit easier. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? You can either wrestle with it or you can replace it. I've always said, always heard best way to break a habit that God doesn't want you to do is replace with something God does want you to do then when you start feeling the urge to go do something that you ought not do right go do the thing that you know you ought to do you run up close to Jesus everything in the flesh and everything in the world is going to run away because it don't like him Right, if you ask him to help you wrestle the flesh, he'll do it. Why? Because it's the will of God for you to be in control of your flesh. He will help you do what God told you to do. It's one of the promises that he gave us. Well, if the goal is holy, what's evil? Anything that falls short of holy. So what, what does evil look like? Evil can look a whole bunch of different ways. But evil is real simple to understand when you start judging it by this book. I'll give you an example. Jesus had risen from the dead. He appears to the disciples. He says, hey, I got business to go take care of. See you all in a little bit. Okay, we're summarizing heavily there. But they get to waiting around Peter, who had just denied the Lord three times before he died, right after he just promised Jesus that he'd go to the cross with him. Right? He's feeling real down. He's feeling like a loser. You guys, if you're the same way as me, the worst thing you can do is for somebody to say, hey, sit down and wait. I don't like waiting. Right? If we could hook a generator up to either one of my legs, and anybody that's ever sat in a pew with me knows, right, I could power the city of Chicago with how much my leg bounces. Right? If it wasn't for those calories that I'm burning a day, I'd be a whole lot bigger than I already am. Okay? Waiting hard. So I don't judge Peter. Peter said, you know what? He didn't say he was going to go do anything evil. He just said, I'm going fishing. He says, I go a fishing, is what he said. That's how you know Peter was a hillbilly. I go a fishing. So, he didn't invite anybody. Go look. He just said, I'm going fishing. Then somebody of the other disciples said, you know what, that sounds like a good idea. And they went with them. And they get out there. Right there on a boat out in the middle of a lake. Okay. Fishing, not like nowadays. Not like you get a yacht and then you go out there with the fishing pole and you set 13 of them up and you just hang around and watch TV until you hear the bell ring on one of the fishing lines. That was not the fishing that they were doing. They were doing commercial fishing. Right? Now the Bible says that Peter was naked. Didn't say that he didn't have any clothes on. Under Hebrew custom, if anything from your you know, thigh or up was showing, you were considered naked. So what's he out there in? He's out there in workout shorts. Right? You've seen worse from bikers that are going 10 miles an hour in the lane in front of you and then traffic's coming this way and you're stuck behind them and they're making you angry. Right? 
They're out there doing real work. Casting nets, hauling them in, rowing a whole big boat. And it says that they'd been out there all night. Right? Well, at nighttime, people can't really see what you're wearing, especially back in the day before spotlights. Okay? Second of all, women weren't around. Right? I don't think that he was dressed indecently. I think he was dressed to do fishing work. Now, it doesn't say that the rest of them were. But I, show me a guy that's ever gone on a commercial fishing vessel, Brother Randy. Right? Gone out to the deck to do work in a three-piece suit and a tie. You ain't going to find it. What was he doing? He was fishing. How was he dressed? Like a fisherman. Then Jesus hollers from the shoreline. Well, if they's out in the middle of the sea, how could they hear him? It's Jesus. They could have heard him if he was talking from heaven. But he says, hey, y'all caught anything? And at first, they don't even recognize it's him. They said, no, we ain't caught nothing. He says, drop the net down one more time. So they bring it up, and then when Peter realizes it's the Lord, he jumps in the water. You know why Peter jumped in the water? Because God called him from being a fisherman to be a fisher of men. And when Peter knew it was the Lord, he said, I'm right back where I was when he found me. And he told me that if I followed him, I wouldn't be a fisher no more. I'd be a disciple. So then he gets back to shore and he's beating himself up even more. You know why it was evil for Peter to be out there dressed like that? Because God didn't want him to be a fisherman no more. What did God prescribe? That after Peter followed him, Peter's going to be an apostle. In fact, you study the book of Acts, Peter was the leader of the first church. He was the chief apostle. It wasn't always right. If you want proof of that, the apostle Paul had to come in and preach to him a few times, and then God himself had to do a little bit of preaching to him. But eventually, what's Peter become? Peter became what God saw when he called him off of that fishing boat. But Peter knew, as soon as he knew it was the Lord, he said, I shouldn't be here. That's why he jumped in the water. Shame. Now, what did he do? He went fishing. But according to what God told Peter, Peter ought to be doing, it was evil. That's why he hid himself. What Adam and Eve do once they realize what they had done was evil? They hid themselves. Out of shame. It was evil for Peter to be on that fishing boat. Now, is fishing an evil thing? No. Plenty of people are still fishing. The father of James and John, Zebedee, where'd they leave him? On the fishing boat. I bet you he's still fishing in the perfect will of God. What's evil? Evil is anything other than what God said. For you. Not for anybody else. Now some things apply to everybody. But thou shalt not kill still in the book. Right? And for Brother Jordan's commentary on the Bible, doesn't really come from Brother Jordan, comes from God, but when I read thou shalt not kill, I read thou shalt not murder. Because when the Bible says that David or when Joshua or when any other of the military leaders went out to face the enemies, they didn't kill, they slew. Two different words. Right? You slay somebody that's an enemy that's trying to do you harm. You kill somebody that had no reason to be slain. You commit murder. Right? God's perfectly in the business of you protecting and defending what God gave you. Why? Because he's told people to do it since the beginning. Go back and look at Abraham. Right? Abraham had all them servants. Well, one time Lot got in trouble, got taken captive by a king. What did he do? He went and he gave all of his servants swords and they went and they got them back. That if the quote-unquote chosen one, Abraham, right, was still right with God when he owned that many swords, it's okay. When's it not right to kill when God's not in it? Right? Evil. You try to use the world's definition, well, kill can mean 19 different things nowadays. You can say kill it, and all you're meaning is shut the lights off. 
right? But evil is evil. It is truly just right and wrong. What's right? What God said. What's wrong? What God said. You know that verse that we all really don't like, that thou shalt have no other gods before me? That's still in the book. Amen. You know what that means? If you've got anything before God in your life, it's evil. Yeah. Right. And we'll sit in here and we'll amen it on Sunday, but then when we know we ought to read our Bible, but that game's on TV, that's evil. Amen. But God tell Israel, turn, repent from the evil and your evil doings. You know what the difference between your flesh having the desire to do evil and you doing it? Because God didn't make you the flesh. You're the new creature. The flesh is what you're stuck with. It's always going to crave evil. The problem is when you let the flesh start killing your spirituality and then you go and you do evil. We are robed in flesh. We are not fleshly beings after God saves us. He quickened that inner man, that spiritual man. That's what drives the vehicle that you're sitting in every day. The flesh is a tool. Right? You guys' this car, if an alarm goes off, you take care of it. Some of y'all, if an alarm goes off on the inside of your car, you don't take care of it, and then that's why you have problems. But every now and then, an alarm will go off in your car and says, hey, low tire pressure. Hey, we're running out of gas. Hey, oil hadn't been changed in a while. And what do you do? You take care of it. Well, every now and then while you're driving this vehicle called a body, you're going to have some things about, hey, I want to go do that. No, we don't need to worry about that. There are certain things you've got to take care of. Eat, sleep, food. Those are the ones that you know you've got to take care of. The rest of them, you just got to make the car go where you want to go. You're the one holding the steering wheel. Right? If the car wants to drive off a certain exit of the road, is it evil if you keep it on the road? No, because you didn't let the car affect you. The car may want to hit every gas stop that it sees in every seedy part of town. No, I know where we're going to go get gas. We're going to go get gas on the right side of town. But we don't have to look at certain things and deal with certain things. That's you being a king rolling and reigning over this flesh. Now, since we were just talking about Peter, don't know where this comes from, but Peter was dressed in a way that he knew that the Lord wouldn't want him to be seen. Why? Because he wasn't a fisherman no more. But, the Bible does say that we're ambassadors from heaven. But we're ambassadors of Christ. We ought to look like Christ, act like Christ, talk like Christ. That's why they were first called Christians in Antioch. I wonder how many people saved on their way to heaven trying to do their best but because the Lord hadn't talked to them about it if they just heard the Lord calling and they knew it, they turned around they was going to see him they'd want to jump off the boat too because they didn't want the Lord to look at them right people on their way to heaven but if you said would you be okay if Jesus showed up and you was dressed like that People know, right? What do they know? They know that they ought to do all things as unto the Lord. That includes shopping for clothes. But do I go around and tell people what they ought to wear? No. Because I'm going to wear all the Star Wars t-shirts I want, and I don't want you to say nothing about it. I'm not talking about what we wear to church. We all know we're supposed to polish up and look nice when we come to church. We're supposed to wear our best. We already talked about that. I'm talking about when it's just you doing yard work. Am I saying go mow the yard in a suit? Brother Randy, I'm not saying go mow the yard in a suit. Right, but there was a way that Peter went fishing and he knew God didn't approve of it. Does God approve of the way that you do things, the way that you're dressed when you go to do it? If God showed up on your seashore, right, and hollered out, and everybody else on the boat said, it's the Lord, if he came up and started talking, he said, oh yeah, he's one of mine. Would everybody else on the work say, yeah, no joke. We know that. He dresses like you dress. He talks like you dress. You know how Jesus was dressed when he was raised as a carpenter? He dressed like a carpenter. 
Right? Jesus knew what work clothes were. Jesus knew what it was to labor with his hands. Knew what it was to exert your will onto something inanimate. inanimate. That, why was that hard to say? He knew about putting your nose to the millstone and then making something out of that effort. I'll use Brother Field not here. Preaching over at the jail. I'll use him mostly because he's testified to all this in public. This ain't news to anybody else. But Brother Phil will tell you, his toolbox looks a whole lot different than everybody else's at Mazak's. Why? Because he's got scriptures and verses and it's all about Jesus on his toolbox. You know how Brother Phil dresses when he goes to work like a welder? But you know how he talks? He talks not like a welder. Brother Brian will tell you, he's over at the jail right now too. Brother Brian will tell you, he got saved here right now. There's nothing wrong, just like there's nothing wrong with fishing. Except it was wrong for Peter to go fishing because he wasn't a fisherman no more. God's not against motorcycles. Right? Brother Brian will tell you, he got saved. God didn't tell him to get rid of the motorcycle. He just got under conviction looking at it because it was covered in skulls. He said, no, I got saved. I'm not, it shouldn't be about dead things no more. It should be about saved things, live things. So what did he do that? He went out and he repainted the motorcycle. Still rides it. God didn't have a problem with the motorcycle. What are you saying, Brother George? The difference between right and wrong sometimes in the real tiny details. Remember the jot and the tittles? What are you saying? If there, I mean, that song that Brother Clint every now and then sings for invitation. That see if there be any evil way in me. What are you asking God? Lord, search me out and show me the thing that I don't even know about myself. Why? Because I don't want any evil in me so that I don't go out and do evil. I want to turn from it. What was the lesson today? Good and evil. You know what we ought to be after revival? We ought to have less evil in us. Striving to the point where you get all the evil out of you. And guess what that's called? Being holy. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.